behind me is the Ludendorff Bridge. And it was here on the 7th of March, 1945, that the Americans would make their first breakthrough into the heartland of Germany as they were able to cross the Ludendorff Bridge intact. Eisenhower and his generals in early March 1945 knew that the Ludendorff Bridge here at Amargen was still standing, but they didn't really favour the terrain here in terms of an amphibious landing onto the eastern bank of the Rhine, most notably because of the hilly mountainous terrain that lay on the east. Instead, they favoured the approaches north of Bonn, where the countryside was more open, which favoured um, tanks and armoured warfare and that ability to have an armoured drive over to the east of Germany. Now the Germans had rigged the bridge with explosives and they were ready to destroy it if needs be. But the area here was lightly defended with weak infantry units and mixed battle groups of essentially what were at this point in the war, waifs and strays from a variety of units as well as the German Home Guard and other smaller Luftwaffe detachments. The span of the Ludendorff Bridge was 1200 feet. But as I said, with the terrain of um, the Erpler Ley, which is that big rocky outcrop behind us, the Germans didn't even really expect an American attack to be launched here. So for them, it was still an option to use the bridge here to be able to get their troops across to the eastern bank, whilst the German forces were destroying bridges north and south of here to prevent the Allies from driving across the Rhine. So on the 3rd of March, Lieutenant General Courtney Hodges of the US First Army ordered three corps to advance down to Remagen with Major General John Leonard's 9th Armoured Division acting as the spearhead. So on the 6th of March, the final remnants of the German 15th Army managed to make it across the Ludendorff Bridge here and to relative safety on the eastern bank of the Rhine. It was also at this time on the 6th of March that Combat Command B, led by Brigadier General William Hogue, had his vehicles and his men finally make it to the outskirts of Remagen. So as Hogue's men of Combat Command B made it to the outskirts of Remagen, they couldn't believe their eyes when they saw that the Ludendorff Bridge was actually still standing across the Rhine. So on the morning of March the 7th, it was a combined task force from the 14th Tank Battalion and the 27th Armoured Infantry of the 9th Armoured Division that managed to make its way close enough to the bridge. It was at this point that the command from the 9th Armoured decided to issue orders to Lieutenant Carl Timmerman for him and his men, along with some M26 Pershing tanks, to seize and capture the Ludendorff Bridge. So it was here on the eastern bank of the Rhine, in this tunnel here that goes through the Erpeler Ley, that the Germans had established their command post and they were able to see the approach on the western side of the Rhine River. So it was from these positions that the Germans were able to focus their defensive firepower onto that western approach of the Ludendorff Bridge. So at 3.15 p.m. on March the 7th, as Lieutenant Timmerman and his men approached the western edge of the bridge, they noticed that one of the spans had been blown already by the German engineers here to prevent tanks from getting across. From these positions, that the Germans were able to observe the Americans as they made their initial approach onto the western span of the Ludendorff Bridge, that they were able to detonate the charges strapped to the bridge and blow it in situ. Lighting the fuse on the charges, initially nothing happened. But then all of a sudden, the bridge seemed to lift off of its um, stanchions in the water and then come back down. Fortunately, the explosives issued to the Germans weren't of the right kind, and this is why it didn't have the impact it needed to actually demolish the bridge properly. And this was extremely lucky for Timmerman and his men because they were on the bridge at the time that it blew up. So as the Germans poured fire onto the span of the bridge, the Americans, through hard work, grit and determination, managed to make it across to the eastern bank. And it's actually Sergeant Alexander A. Drabic who's credited as the first American to set foot on the eastern bank of the Rhine. Now in the film, The Bridge at Raymargen, he's actually portrayed as Sergeant Angel, but he was a real guy and he was the first one to make it across onto that eastern side.
After the Americans managed to capture the Ludendorff Bridge intact and they started to push units across onto here, the eastern bank of the Rhine River, they then realized that they needed to bring every type of available anti-aircraft defense to this location to protect the bridgehead. So on the afternoon of the 7th of March, Captain Denton from the 482nd Anti-Aircraft Artillery Automatic Weapons Battalion managed to get his unit to the head of Combat Command B. So by 3 a.m. on the morning of the 8th of March, the 482nd arrived over there on the western bank of the Rhine River. And it was at this point that all battalion-sized anti-aircraft and heavy weapons battalions were being called on from 3rd Corps to come to this area in order to protect the bridgehead. Colonel James Madison, 3 Corps, 16th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Group's commanding officer, dispatched a further two heavy weapons battalions, anti-aircraft battalions, here to this location. So by the morning of the 9th of March, 1945, there were five anti-aircraft battalions set up in and around the area around Raymargan. Each battalion here was equipped with four M3 half-tracks, each of which had the M45 quad-mounted 50 cal system mounted on the rear of the truck. In total, by the 9th of March, there was over 80 guns all pointing skyward on the lookout for any roving Luftwaffe aircraft looking to target the bridge. Colonel Madison had positioned anti-aircraft guns all the way on the riverbank to all the way up here on the eastern side on top of the Erpel Allee where I'm currently stood. And he said to his guys, don't worry about identification. If it's in the air, shoot it down. To put it into perspective, Colonel James Madison of the 16th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Group said that the show here at Remagen was the million dollar show. And that's because he said that they went through a million dollars worth of ammunition every time the Luftwaffe dared show up. So when Hitler finally learned of the capture of the Ludendorff Bridge on the 7th of March, 1945, he was furious. He could not believe that the Germans here had allowed it to uh, fall into American hands. So on that, he ordered the bridge to be destroyed at whatever cost and to employ all weapons at the Germans' disposal. Initially, Goering looked to send in ME-262s to bomb the bridge, but due to their bomb sites, they weren't too effective. Goering then ordered the Arado AR-234 jet bombers from Kampfgeschwader 76, usually based in Norway, for them to deploy south and to try and attack the bridge down there. And what's interesting about that is this was the first time they were used to attack tactical targets, especially here, right in the heart of Germany. So over the next six days, Kampfgeschwader 76 would fly nine sorties over the Ludendorff Bridge in an attempt to destroy it using thousand pound bombs. They failed, but in the process, they lost seven of their revolutionary jet bombers. So the Germans didn't just use their jet aircraft to attack the bridge here. The 14th Flieger Division also used FW-190s and JU-87s, the Stuka, to try and attack the bridge. Now, ideally, the Stuka would have been the best aircraft to attack the bridge down there because the Stuka was able to come in from high altitude, put its dive brakes out, go into a very steep dive and drop a bomb with almost pinpoint accuracy. However, this hill that we stood on is at about 1500 foot or about 460 meters. With all the anti-aircraft defenses here on the bridge, it meant that the Stukas either had to come in from a very high dive angle or fly up and down the river. Either way though, that attack profile was extremely dangerous for them. So on the 8th of March, 10 JU-87s from Night Attack Group 1 came to attack the Ludendorff Bridge. The raid though wasn't very successful and out of their 10 aircraft, six were lost. So later that day on the 8th of March, at around 4.45 p.m., nine Luftwaffe aircraft came to attack the bridge. Eight were Stukas escorted by one ME-109. The anti-aircraft fire was so intense that eight of the aircraft failed to return. 30 minutes later, despite the first raid of Stukas being disastrously expensive for the Luftwaffe, eight more tried to attack the bridge and all were shot down. The next day, on the 9th of March, and having failed to learn their lessons, but in a desperate attempt to stop the Americans from bringing more troops across the bridgehead, the Luftwaffe sent a further 17 bombers to try and hit the bridge. All missed, and 13 of them ended up being shot down by the American anti-aircraft defenses around the bridge area. The anti-aircraft defenses here set up by the Americans were so potent that between the 7th and the 17th of March, 1945, the Americans estimated that they shot down 109 Luftwaffe aircraft attacking the bridge in this area, whilst probably destroying a further 36. 
That was out of 367 sorties flown by the Luftwaffe attacking the bridge. So on the 17th of March, 11 V2 rockets would be fired by SS Abteilung 500 from Hellendorn in the Netherlands against the bridge at Remagen. One of those 11 V2 rockets here on the 17th of March would land just behind me down there. In that position was the 284th Engineer Combat Battalion's headquarters. And when it struck at 12.20, the men who experienced it and were lucky enough not to be killed said it felt like an earthquake. So the V2 rocket narrowly missed the bridge by only 270 meters. That's how close Hitler's fanatical order came to actually destroying the Ludendorff bridge with a V2 rocket. Not only did the Germans try and attack the Ludendorff Bridge and destroy it from the air, they also tried to send barges laden with explosives down the river, then try and detonate on the bridge. But fortunately, the US forces were able to capture it. They also tried floating mines down to the uh, bridge itself. But again, the US combat engineers that were attached to the units in this area had set up anti-mine uh, nets, anti-torpedo nets, to prevent that happening. And one of the most audacious attempts to destroy the bridge was led by none other than Otto Skortzeny, Hitler's best commando. Skortzeny was responsible for all the disruption caused in the American lines during the Battle of the Bulge, and he was also the man who planned and executed the rescue of Mussolini from Gran Sasso. So the plan was for German divers using Italian breathing apparatus to drift downstream and then attach explosives to the bridge and detonate it. So on the 17th of March, the German divers entered the water, but because the Americans had expanded their bridgehead so far at this point, they had to enter 17 kilometers upstream from the bridge and then clung onto oil barrels to drift downstream toward the bridge itself. Now, being March, the water temperature was pretty cold. It was only seven degrees Celsius or about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Unluckily for the German frogmen, however, the 738th tank battalion were using their top secret 13 million candle power lights mounted to the top of M3 tanks and they were spotted in the water. Now the divers were the last attempt by the Germans to destroy the Ludendorff bridge because on the 17th of March, 1945, all the damage it had sustained from when the Germans um, initiated the demolition charges on it, from the bombing attacks and all the troops moving across it, it finally fell into the Rhine after 10 days of getting the American forces to the eastern bank of the Rhine River.
So for the final part of this video, I have come to the Friedhof here in Bernbach, which is about 40 minutes to the northeast of Remagen itself. And there's a very special reason I've come to this particular uh, German war cemetery, and it's to pay respects and to remember the German officers who were purely doing their job in defending the bridge, but as a result of their failure to hold the bridge and stop the Americans from crossing it, they were summarily tried and executed by the, their Wehrmacht chain of command, and it's here where they're buried. So you see here we've got all of the German graves, and there is actually a memorial plaque um, that denotes, I think, where the four officers that were tried and executed are actually buried. So we'll go and take a look at it. So this is the plaque here for the four Wehrmacht officers who were executed as a result of their failure to hold the Remagen Bridge in March 1945. And we've got Major Hans Scheller, Major Herbert Strobel, Major August Kraft, and Oberleutnant Karl Heinz Peters. And it basically says that um, in the defense of the Remagen Bridge, um, or their failure to hold it, they were then executed in Rimbach und Oberirsen um, on the 13th and 14th of March 1945, so a week after the bridge had fallen into the hands of the Americans. And interestingly, Major Hans Scheller, he was the real-life version of Robert Vaughan's character, Major Paul Kruger in the film, The Bridge at Remagen. And so looking at the other German soldiers that are buried here and not just the four officers that were responsible for the bridge at Remagen, but I've checked all of these German graves here and they're all from around the 17th um, and the 20th of March, 1945. So all within that time frame of post the Americans crossing um, the Remagen Bridge and then expanding their bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Rhine. So all of the soldiers here are all connected with very much with the defence of this area. Um, and I always think it's really interesting having visited the cemetery at Omaha, uh, the American cemetery, the ones in Luxembourg, um, numerous British ones, and just how the different countries look after their war dead and commemorate them with their headstones and the German ones even the First World War ones are always very dark and seeing these, it's just that constant reminder of um, just how the, the Germans naturally don't glorify their war dead, but they do have their own way of remembering them. And you can see they've got wreaths laid on them from uh, Remembrance Sunday from last year, but they just haven't been tended to since, which it's an awkward one to deal with, but I think it's a shame that they aren't tended to a little bit more um, respectfully, maybe, only in as much as they were young men um, at some point and they were somebody's sons and brothers. And it, uh, it's a very difficult one though because of the side they were fighting for and that's understandable, but it's interesting to see them and interesting to see them in what is also a public graveyard. So. If you've enjoyed this episode all about the Bridget Ray Margan and the US 9th Armoured Division's capturing of it in March 1945, please consider hitting that like button and consider subscribing to the channel. It all really helps. Okay, see you all in the next one.